All right, so we are here um, to talk about love, same-sex attraction, and tolerance. And I want to start off this talk by making it very clear that we are not here to talk about a topic, and we are not here to talk about a controversial issue. We are here to talk about people. And if you are somebody who is in this room who experiences same-sex attraction, this is your home. The church is your home, and we are not here to tolerate you, just to kind of put up with you and to let you be here in spite of that. We are here because we love you. We love you. Amen. This is very much where you belong. This is your home. And it seems so often, you know, in our culture when we start talking about uh, same-sex attraction, and we talk about being a Catholic in the same sentence, then automatically the first word that we hear is bigot. And it's kind of like, oh, I haven't even said anything yet really, you know. So I just wanted to start by putting up the definition of the word bigot on the screen here. And it says, that is not a definition. <laughs> A bigot is a person who hates or refuses to accept the members of a particular group, one who regards or treats the members of a group with hatred or intolerance. But I think that, you know, we usually when we hear this word, when we hear the word bigot, people are kind of using it in a way that says, you know, if you don't agree with me, then that must mean that you hate me. That must mean that you hate me, which is absolutely untrue. Absolutely untrue about the church's teaching on same-sex attraction. You know, on the contrary, there is no room for hate whatsoever in this conversation and in this topic at all. And the church neither hates nor deserves to be hated for its teaching because its teaching is 100% about love. 100% about love. And when we look at this definition, if we could put that back up there just for a second. And we read that a person who hates or refuses to accept the members of a particular group, one who regards or treats the member of a group with hatred or intolerance. It's really ironic that it seems like a lot of people act as bigots towards the Catholic Church, don't they? They kind of put us in this box. And they do so because they think that we teach bigotry, right? And it's just this crazy misconception. And Fulton Sheen has this amazing quote that I love when he says, millions of people hate the Catholic Church for what they think it is. But not even a hundred hate it for what it really is. Y'all, I am so blessed and so excited that we have this opportunity. This opportunity to gather together with all of you. This is a big room full of people. And dispel, let's dispel hate from both sides of this conversation, right? That we can come together in love and that we can respect one another. And I really, really firmly believe that this talk is a talk for everybody. This is a talk for everyone in this room. And I really think that there's probably the whole gamut of people who are here as well. There's probably people here who are struggling with same-sex attraction and people who aren't. People who embrace the church's teaching on this topic and people who don't understand it or totally disagree with it. And all of that is totally fine. Whoever you are and wherever you are, we are here to gather together and to all be ministered to, to all join together in this way. And I think one of the things that makes it so difficult to talk about this is that when the world uses the words identity, sex, love, they have a very distinct definition of what that means, what those words mean. And when we as a church use words like identity, sex, and love, we have a very distinct definition of what those words mean. And when we start to talk, you know, on both of these sides, these words, you know, the definitions are the same, but they're not really the same, which makes the conversation really confusing and really difficult. I'll give you an analogy. I love burritos. Okay, burritos are like my love language. I'm a eating Chipotle, not scared of E. coli, all right? I love it. I ate it twice this week, all right? Love burritos, right? My favorite place to go in Texas for burritos is a restaurant called Chewy's. And Chewy's, oh, y'all have Chewy's. 
my favorite. So my favorite thing to order at Chewy's is literally called the Big As Yo Face Burrito. Big as your face. I sit down and I'm like, I don't need a menu. Big as your face. That's what I need, okay? So when I order the Big as your face burrito, I order it with ground beef and bean. So now imagine that I order this burrito. The waitress brings it out and sets it down in front of me and I cut into it. And the beef inside is raw and bleeding, all right? And I'm like, uh, this is not, not really what I, was, what I was talking about. And the waitress could say to me, you ordered ground beef. You can order ground beef and bean, right? It's the same, but it's not the same. It's the same, but it's not really the same. And so this is where there can be a lot of confusion. And so I'm going to talk today about these three words, about identity, about sex, and love, and about what we see them as meaning in our lives as Catholics. So we're going to go ahead um, and start with the word identity. And identity obviously is a big hot button word for us in our culture. And really what it boils down to is who are we? Who are we? So I'm going to give you two quotes to kind of help um, shed a little bit of light on this. The first one comes from Genesis chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 and it says, when God created human beings, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and when they were created, he blessed them and he named them humankind. So that's the first quote. Second quote comes from Miley Cyrus. And she says, it has nothing to do with my body parts or how how I dress or what I look like. It is literally just about how we feel. I want to show you a video clip that is going to kind of give us a picture of how these things have played out in our society. There's been a lot of talk about identity lately, but how far does it go? And is it possible to be wrong? We went to the University of Washington to find out. Are you aware of the debate happening in Washington State around um, the ability to access bathrooms, locker rooms, spas based on gender identity and gender expression? I I think people should be able to have access to the facility. I think uh, bathrooms could and potentially should be gender neutral because there doesn't need to be a classification for differences. I think people definitely should have the ability to go into whichever locker room they want. Uh, I feel like at least public universities should do their best to accommodate for those who do not have a specific uh, gender identity. You know, whether you identify as male or female and whether your sex at birth is matching to that, you should be able to utilize the resources. So if I told you that I was a woman, what would your response be? Good for you, okay, like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'll be like, what? <laughs> really? I don't have a problem with it. I'd ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would your response be? I mean, I might be a little surprised, but I would say, good for you, like, yeah, be who you are. <laughs> I would maybe think you had some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you similarly came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions just because on the outside I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, (laughs) I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I, it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason need to do that now. If that's where you feel like mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? (laughs) Because you're not. (laughs) No, I don't think you're six feet five. If you truly believed you're six five, I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. (laughs) So you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place. 
as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I wouldn't just go like, oh, you're wrong. Like, that's wrong to believe in it. Because I mean, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So I can be a Chinese woman. You. <laughs> um. Sure. But I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. If you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt that you were six foot five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you were six foot five or Chinese or a woman. It shouldn't be hard to tell a five nine white guy that he's not a six foot five Chinese woman, but clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? And what does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? video it's confusing right it's it's a little confusing as we watch this and I, I think that you know so often we, we want to be nice like we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings uh, and those sorts of things and that's so good like that comes from a really really wonderful place but what makes it really difficult is that so often I think we've forgotten who we are and that we've forgotten who we are in an overarching way as a people and how we see ourselves matters. Our identity matters. And this is because our behavior will flow from our identity. I'm going to say that again. Our behavior will flow from our identity. How we see ourselves ma matters. And I want to speak to every single one of you about your identity because your identity is not your attractions. Your identity is not your attractions. Your identity is something that cannot change no matter what. At your very core, your identity is a child of God. No matter what. Whoever you are. That is who you are at your very core. Our attractions, on the other hand, are something that we experience. And sometimes our attractions can change based on life experiences that we've, ha uh, that we've had or things that we think. Sometimes they're things that we just have. So, for example, burritos, right? I have love burritos. I'm attracted to burritos. If we took all of you to a museum, an art museum, there would be a different experience for everybody who is here about what you're attracted to and what you're not attracted to. And there would be certain things in that museum that you love, certain things that you like, okay, and certain things that you just don't like at all, that you can't stand. Our attractions are something that we, are ex that we experience. So gender labels or words like gay or homosexual and things like that, they don't talk about our identity, who we are. They talk about our experiences. And I think that this is a very, very important point because no matter who you are, whether you experience same-sex attraction, whether you are straight, whether you're somebody who experiences transgenderism, you are a child of God. And what is so important is that our behavior will flow from our identity and who we see ourselves as matters. And so if somebody buys into the fact that their identity is their experiences, that their identity is their sexual ex attractions, then of course your very personhood is going to feel suffocated if you cannot act on it. Of course. But for all of us, no matter who we are, if we buy into the fact that our identity is a child of God, then our behavior will always flow from that. But what makes it really difficult, I think, in our culture is that our attractions so often are over-sexualized. We can see this so easily just from turning on the TV and seeing any kind of commercial. Everything is sexy. Everything's sexy. Cars are sexy. I saw a commercial the other day with this laptop, and it's like, say, it says, like, sexy across the screen. And it's like turning around. I'm like, I don't understand. It's like, a laptop is sexy. Burgers are sexy. Everything is so oversexed in our culture. And this is really true of our human relationships and our friendships, I think, even as well. So oftentimes after a talk like this, you know, uh, somebody might come up and say, it, it's a girl that says, I, I feel like I am attracted to this other girl. 
And it's, you know, somebody that I think is so beautiful. And she has all these gifts. I love being around her. I love being in her presence. I want to be close to her. I want to have this deep relationship with her. And I'm confused. I'm confused because I don't necessarily feel like I'm a lesbian. But my other friends are telling me, you know, it's this woman crush and, you know, you should experiment, you should explore, and that these are homosexual feelings. And so if you're somebody who has thought that and had that experience, then I want to tell you, you know, not necessarily. That's not necessarily true. But that we are supposed to be attracted to other people. And we can be attracted to another woman or another man or even uh, as a woman being attracted to another man. And it doesn't have to be sexual. We can love one another. We can appreciate one another. We can love to be around one another and absorb God's goodness without it having to be a sexual experience. But for some people, it is. For some people, it is a sexual attraction that they have to the same sex. And so for people who experience this, it can just be utterly crippling. It can be devastating. It can be difficult. It can be confusing. And I think for so many people who are in this boat, they feel like they have two different options. And the first option that they feel is to hide in the closet. I want to share with you a couple of quotes from some people who um, experienced this and tried this way of life. One person said, all I remember is feeling super lonely. Another man said, I was so desperate for someone to give me some attention, so desperate for some physical affection, and I needed somebody to let me know that I existed, to let me know that I was okay. Another man said, my sexual attractions were hidden from everyone in my life. I couldn't go to my family. And the only people I felt like I could talk to were the men that I was having sex with. Another woman said, things were falling apart around me and I just needed human caring from somewhere. I think the second way that people tend to feel that they can deal with the things that they're experiencing is to embrace and to experiment. And usually this means in a sexual sense. Again, I want to give you some quotes of people who have experienced this and tried this type of a lifestyle. The first person says, the gay lifestyle proposes that the answer to our thirst is sex. Secular media makes you feel this embrace. One man said, I couldn't wait until I turned 18 because then I could really enter in. I was, it was exhilarating at first, and I finally felt like I wasn't alone. There were finally people like me, but that feeling didn't last long. In fact, the depression continued to worsen. When I was a teenager, my attraction became sexualized, and it brought me so much turmoil, and I felt completely alone. Another person said, I went to the gay bar because at least I knew there that people would accept me, they would understand me, and they would give me the attention and the affirmation and the acceptance that I needed. But what if there was a third way? What if there was a third way, one that didn't invite you to hide in shame, one that didn't invite you to satisfy your thirst in a, sex, in a sexual sense? What if there was a third way that celebrated and had a reverence for what sex is? Because our world tells us that if you can't have sex, then you can't have love. And I want to now talk about the second of these terms that we as a church use and that the world uses, and we define them in a way that's the same, but it's really not the same. And that is the word sex. And if we don't get this, if we don't get this point in this teaching, then we cannot understand the church's teaching on same-sex attraction. This is so, so important. And the fact is that in its proper context, God loves sex. I remember the first time I heard anybody say that, and I was a teen at a Steubenville Youth Conference, and the um, chastity speaker was up there on the stage, and she said, God loves sex. I was like, ah, what words did you just put in the same sentence? I don't think that those belong, you know, back up. I'm not sure. But really, God created sex. He made it. He could have gone with the cabbage patch. He could have gone with the stork, but he didn't. This is what God designed. He designed our sexuality. 
and he gave it to us as a gift. So I'm going to blow your mind even further, all right? Our sexuality is actually sacramental. All of the sacraments have two parts. They have their matter and they have their form. Their matter is the physical thing that happens. The form is the words that are spoken in the sacrament. For a sacrament to, to take place, to be valid, it has to have both of these two things. So, for example, the sacrament of baptism, the matter is the pouring on of the water. The form is the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Confirmation, the matter is the oil, and the words are, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the sacrament of marriage, the form is the vows that are spoken between a husband and a wife. The matter is the sexual union as the two become one flesh on their wedding night. What this means is that we are supposed to encounter God and receive grace through our sexuality. And the problem is that the world glorifies sex, but it fails to see its glory, its beauty in which God has given to it. And what makes it so holy is that we get to participate with God in an incredible gift of who he is as a co-creator a co-creator. And we can look even to the Trinity, and the Trinity is, by its very definition, it's a family. We have God the Father who pours himself out completely, holding nothing back into the Son. And the Son in turn receives that gift, and he pours himself out completely in a gift of love into the Father. And this love exchange is so strong and so powerful that from it spirates a person. And that person is the Holy Spirit. In the sacrament of marriage, a husband pours himself out completely into his wife. The wife receives that gift and pours herself out completely into her husband. And that love exchange is so strong that nine months later you have to give it a name. Heaven, my friends, amen, is so beautiful because heaven is not sexual. But sexual intimacy is heavenly. It draws us closer to the Lord. We get to experience him through the sacrament of marriage. And sex, sexual intimacy, sexual intercourse in and of itself has two purposes. And the first one is procreation. You might be surprised to hear that it's not recreation. Procreation is the very first main purpose of sexuality, right? Right? And children are not like this add-on bonus part of sex. You cannot separate the two. It's what sex does. It's its very purpose. And to try to separate them is like trying to separate the heart from pumping blood. All right? It's what it does. It's what it was created for. And you cannot separate the two. Or another analogy might be to say it's like trying to separate food from energy, calories, from the vitamins and the minerals that it brings into our body. We cannot separate the two in a healthy, healthy way. It's what it was created for, and it is beautiful within that. The second purpose of sexuality is union of man and wife. That the two become one flesh, and that they join together, pouring out that love exchange into one another. And we could think, you know, it's amazing how God created us and created our bodies, that the reproduction system is the only system in our body that needs something else to do what it was created for. The nervous system, the respiratory system, all of these things, you know, they function on their own to keep us alive and to do um, what their purpose is, what they're created for. But the reproduction system doesn't make any sense by itself. And if you think about your body for a moment, and you think about it by itself, it's just kind of weird, right? It's just kind of weird. It needs something else in order to do what it was created for. And now the question that you might be thinking is what about an infertile couple, somebody who is not able to have babies? The infertile couple, they come together in this union, but what they do does not biologically block or disallow God from doing what sex was created for. And this is, my friends, the bottom line. Like, this is the bottom line not just on this topic. This is the bottom line on any topic that has to do with sexuality that the world disagrees with the church on. All of them. 
And that's why this really is a talk for all of us, for every single one of us. Because within its design, God created sexuality as this beautiful exchange. And anything that does not allow sex to be able to be used for its purpose as God designed, and that doesn't bring us closer to God, but it brings us further away from him. This is true for people who are unmarried and who are tempted with premarital sex. Premarital sex is not within the design of God's plan for sexuality. Therefore, it doesn't bring us closer to God. It draws us further away. Sex in marriage, that is contraceptive, is not God's design for sex. Therefore, it doesn't bring us closer to God. It draws us further away. And the same is true for sex within a homosexual relationship. That it doesn't bring us closer to God. It is not within his design. And the answer for the couple who is not married is chastity. The answer for the couple who is married is chastity. And the answer for someone who experiences same-sex attraction is chastity. And that this is a call, chastity is a call for every single one of us. Every single one of us, no matter where we are. A virtue that the Lord wants to give us and to work through. And he wants to be able to do this within the context of love. And again, I said before, you know, the world says that if we can't have sex, then we can't have love. And this is the last of those three terms that I want to talk to you about today. And that is the term love. That what is love? And in an amazing way, you know, oftentimes when two people are in love, whether it's in a heterosexual or homosexual relationship, oftentimes when people are in love, the world assumes that that means a sexual relationship. But the amazing and beautiful thing is that so often, abstinence can be an even greater expression of love. In a certain situation. So you can think about, you know, a teenage couple, boyfriend and a girlfriend. And the boyfriend might say to the girlfriend, you know, if you really loved me, if you really loved me, then you would sleep with me. You would have sex with me. And in this case, this is not an expression of how much he loves her, but an expression of how little he loves her. Amen. For those of us who are married, we get to experience the virtue of chastity and abstinence through natural, plan- natural family planning. For our priests and for our nuns, they have given the gift to the Lord of their chastity. And in the gift of their abstinence is not a repression, but it's rather an expression. An expression of their love, not a repression. This is true for every single one of us. That abstinence can be an incredible way for us to lay down our lives. Lay down our lives. Jesus himself set the example for this. Jesus didn't just set the example in the virtue of chastity. He set the example in every single way. Emptying himself out completely. And as you know, a common hashtag, you know, on this topic is love wins. Love wins. And if there was ever a hashtag to sum up Christianity, this is it. Hashtag love wins. Because no greater love is there than this. No greater love is there than this, than to lay down his life for one's friends. For the person who experiences same-sex attraction, you have a dignified call. A dignified call to heroic chastity. To allow Jesus to carry your cross with you. To let your thirst be satisfied with Christ's thirst. To join together with him. And to be able to come to the church 
to be able to be welcomed here, to be able to find the Lord in the sacraments. Because what the church doesn't say to a man who experiences same-sex attraction, he doesn't say, you can't love this other man. On the contrary, the church says, I command you to love this other man. And to love him to eternity, to eternity and beyond. And for all of us, this is our call. All of us are called to live this call of chastity. And this is the third way. This is the third way is not to hide, not to hide in shame, and not to embrace sexual intimacy, but instead to live what Jose Maria Escriva said when he says, when you decide firmly to lead a clean life, chastity will not be a burden on you. It will be a crown of triumph. And for each of us as we go forward, whatever your walk of life may be, single, married, straight, feeling homosexual tendencies, transgender, wherever you are, we all have the same call. And I am not here to say that it's the same level of difficulty. Because some of these crosses are going to be much heavier and much harder. But I will promise you, the Lord will never be outdone in generosity. And what we give to him, the sacrifices that we make for him, he will return them to us always in a way that we can never imagine. He will not allow himself to be outdone in generosity. So I, I want to finish with um, this beautiful article that was written by a man who experiences same-sex attraction. And I think that he explains this what he has experienced and what he has discovered in a way um, that I, I could never be able to do. He says, when I go to confession, sometimes I mention the fact that I'm gay just to give the priest some context. I've always gotten one of two responses, either compassion, encouragement, and admiration, because the celibate life is difficult and profoundly countercultural, or nothing at all, not even a ripple, as if I had just confessed eating too much on Thanksgiving. Of the two responses, my ego prefers the first, who doesn't like thinking of himself as some kind of hero. But the second might make more sense. Being gay doesn't mean that I'm special or extraordinary. It just means that my life is not always easy. And as my friend said when I told him recently about my homosexuality, he said, I guess if it wasn't that, it would have been something else, meaning that nobody lives without a burden of one kind or another. But what I wonder is where are all these bigoted Catholics I keep hearing about? When I told my family a year ago, not one of them responded with anything but love and understanding. Nobody acted like I had a disease. Nobody started treating me differently or looking at me funny. And the same is true of every one of the Catholic friends that I have told. They love me for who I am. Actually, the only time that I get shock or disgust or disbelief, the only time that I've noticed people treating me differently after I tell them is when, some, is when I tell someone who supports the gay lifestyle, celibacy, you must be some kind of confused man. <laughs> Hooray for tolerance and different viewpoints. I'm grateful to gay activists for some things like making people more aware of the prevalence of homosexuality, making homophobia less socially acceptable. But they also make it more difficult for me to be understood, to be accepted for who I am and for what I believe. If I want open-mindedness, acceptance, and understanding, I look to Catholics. Is it hard to be gay and Catholic? Yes. Because like everybody, I sometimes want things that are not good for me. The church doesn't let me have these things, not because she's mean, but because she's a good mother. If my son or daughter wanted to eat sand, I would tell them, that's not what eating is for. It won't nourish you. It will hurt you. And maybe my daughter has some kind of condition that makes her like sand better than she likes food, but I still wouldn't let her eat it. And actually, if she was young or stubborn enough, I might not be able to reason her with her, and I might just have to make a rule against eating sand, even if she thought that I was mean. So the church doesn't oppose gay marriage because it's wrong. She opposes it because it's impossible, just as impossible as living on sand. The church believes, and I believe, in a universe that means something, and in a God who made the universe. He made men and women, and he designed sex and marriage from the ground up. And in that universe, gay marriage doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with the rest of the picture, and I'm not about to throw out the rest of the picture. So yes, it's hard to be gay and Catholic, and it's hard to be anything and Catholic. 
because I don't always get to do what I want. Show me a religion where you always get to do what you want, and I will show you a pretty shabby, lazy religion, something not worth living or dying for or even getting up in the morning for. Would I trade in my Catholicism for a worldview where I get to marry a man? Would I trade in the Eucharist and the Mass and all the rest of it? Being a Catholic means believing in a God who literally waits in the chapel for me, hoping that I'll stop by just for 10 minutes so he can pour out his love and healing on my heart. Which is more, all of this or getting to have sex with who I want? I wish everybody, straight or gay, had as beautiful as a life as I have. Isn't that beautiful? So beautiful. The Bishop's Committee on Marriage and Family has this incredible quote. This is our church. This is who we are. This is what we believe when they say we stretch out our hands to our homosexual brothers and sisters. Though at times you may feel discouraged, hurt, or angry, do not walk away from the family of your Christian community. For all of us love you, and it is in you that God's love is revealed. You are always our children. For those of you who are here in this room who do not experience same-sex attraction, this is our call. And in a place that understands all too well the hate and the hurt, in a place that has experienced it firsthand, as a church, y'all, this is our call. As you guys go forward from this conference weekend, you have a calling and an opportunity to minister and to love in your state of Florida. To be able to go out, to love people enough to tell them the truth, but also to love them enough to meet them exactly where they are. I gave this talk last weekend at a Superville conference in Minnesota. Right afterwards, this girl came running up to me, and she said, can I hug you? And I was like, of, of course. And so she gave me a hug, and she said, thank you for telling me that I'm loved. No one has told me that. Thank you for telling me that I am loved here. This is your job. This is your calling to go forward from this room and to be sure that everyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, knows that they are loved and to not be afraid to love until it hurts. And so we're going to just have some time just to pray, and to pray for healing on this topic, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, just to invite God, to invite God to come into your heart, into the depths, and to show him who he created you to be.